Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on September 26th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. This hour, we're going to hear about the climate policies in Florida of, under Governor Ron DeSantis and his pledge to promote fossil fuel development over renewable energy. And joining us by Zoom is our guest, Susan Glickman, a programs and policy consultant to both Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Rethink Florida. She's worked with the National Resources Defense Council, the Center for Climate Integrity, and the Union of Concerned Scientists to address the climate crisis. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Susan. Great. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Well, in this show, we're going to talk about Florida's climate and energy policies, but let's start off with even why it's why it matters. What do we know about the impacts of global heating on Florida? Well, um, we're already seeing it uh, in Florida and around the world with historic uh, extreme weather, extreme heat, more intense storms. Uh, we saw it, particularly Hurricane Ian is a great example of a very slow moving kind of climate impacted storm. And this term uh, that we all are using now, rapid intensification, because the waters are warm. We had uh, water temperatures up to 100 degrees around the Keys. So the warmer water, you know, acts like jet fuel for for these hurricanes and, you know, makes them more intense. So, you know, we're seeing it all around us and you know insurance if you can get it now right and this is not just here in florida but of course we have wildfires in california and up in canada um so uh, it's it's just it's it's actually kind of distressing uh sean we um, i've been working on climate and energy issues for more than two decades and to just watch this kind of unravel before our eyes and we're still and i know we're going to talk about this today dealing with people who would try to um, you know, just sort of discredit the science. And this has been going on for many, many, many decades. So we've known about this issue for since the 40s. Um, I went to the University of Texas, so I'm a little partial to President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who in 1965, three weeks after his inauguration, said this generation is altering the composition of the Earth's atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. So in anybody's book, we've known about this a long time and the industries that profit from, you know, fossil fuels, not unlike the tobacco industry profited from selling cigarettes. Um, they have tried to confuse people on the science and they do a pretty good job of it. Uh, and here we are today to talk about ever more in 2023 uh, that we have leaders uh, that are just putting out just solid misinformation. And uh, so that's that's what brings us here today for this discussion. And just to uh, say a little bit more about the impacts, not just in Florida, but around the world, let me read just a couple of sentences from the AP. This summer was the hottest ever measured in the Northern Hemisphere, according to the World Meteorological Organization and the European Climate Service Copernicus. Millions of Americans were all were affected by the worst wildfire season in Canada's history, which sent choking smoke into parts of the U.S. And around the world, extreme heat, storms, flooding, and wildfires have affected tens of millions of people this year, with scientists saying that climate change has made such events more likely and more intense. And we heard on the NPR news headlines today that that the southern sea ice is at its lowest level ever, that warming oceans are to blame, and that there's this feedback loop, loop with less sea ice, then that's, gonna, that's going to warm the oceans even more. So there's uh, quite a lot of climate science in the news and the effects of climate change already in the news. Um, but let me let me get your response maybe to to some of those that we, that you haven't addressed yet. Well, interesting in the lead up as as we were waiting to to open up this program, you know, was a report about the um, West Antarctic, really the ice sheets. And um, th what's happening is you, you use the term feedback loop. That's something that's kind of kept me up at night uh, for many years. And but that is what we're seeing, actually. So the West Antarctic ice sheet, which was always considered really solid for a long, long, long time. They're now seeing the waters kind of lapping under it. 
And, you know, it's just you, you, once you get going, then the ice and then it's reflecting, right, you know, more of the sunlight and it's warming even more. So the warmer, wetter weather sort of makes everything worse, you know, whether it's blue grain algae or it's, it's, it's hurricanes. So, um, <clears throat> you know, our, it said our insurance is through the roof. It's just so much is going, going on here. So, I, I really fear that people don't really understand these impacts because in the climate world, we've sort of geared thing toward a degree and a half with the Paris Accord. The the agreement was we're going to keep the temperature under a degree and a half of warming. Well, we've actually passed that. Um, and it may be not a permanent passing of it and can go back and forth a little bit, but we have passed a degree and a half. That is a Celsius figure. Right. I think that that most people don't even know what it means. They don't understand that it's Celsius and they don't know what it means to them. So what I would what I say a lot is that in order to really keep Florida above water, you know, we've already seen a foot of sea rise since the 60s. There's another foot baked in. It doesn't even matter what we do. If we turn the CO2 spigot off tomorrow, now that eventually will sort of level out. Um <clears throat> But the decisions we make today are going to determine whether we keep it to two feet. And governments and others were adapting to two feet of sea rise. But beyond two feet is too much, right? But people understand what a foot is and, and sort of what that means because they can conceptualize it. So uh, the pillars of Florida's economy <clears throat> are tourism, agriculture, real estate, construction ports are all threatened, you know, by this warming and the sea rise. So we've got to make the decisions. So right now, Florida energy policy is the equivalent <clears throat> of walking into your bathroom, the sink is overflowing, and you turn around and you pull the towels off the hook and you start to mop the floors. We have given out, the state of Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis has given out about $2 billion worth of towels. There is a fair amount of activity going on around resilience and adaptation and vulnerability assessments and all these things are necessary and important. But what we're failing to do is to turn the faucet off. Right. We are not doing anything. In fact, you know, he is doubling down on a more national level, you know, about energy dominance and to, you know, stop attending to preparing even for climate change. So that's that's where we're at. That's Florida energy policy. You know, the sink is overflowing and we are handing out towels, uh, but that's it. Our guest is Susan Glickman, Programs and Policy Consultant for both the Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Rethink Energy Florida. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. If you would like to weigh in, you can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. Please sign your name if you do. Later on in the show, we'll probably take phone calls. That's at 813 239 nine six six three and susan you know as if, if we haven't given up a, a large enough laundry list of some of the effects of climate change so far there's one that i rarely think about but it's really important that that i'm learning um some news on just now um it could have a huge impact on global weather yesterday the scientific journal geophysical research letters published an article called robust weakening of the gulf stream during the past four decades observed in the florida straits and in that article it said we conclude with a high degree of confidence that gulf stream transport has slowed by about four percent in the past 40 years the first conclusive unambiguous observational evidence that the this ocean current has undergone significant change in the recent past why should we be caring about the Gulf Stream? Well, that has a lot to do, um, you know, with with all sorts of things from fish, you know, and and species, um, you know, preservation, as well as just, you know, how the warming happens up in the north. Right. So you could uh, really slow that down. And that that has been happening. I would also be remiss if I just didn't mention people's health. You know, there is so much going on with extreme heat. And, you know, people and in Florida, we have 
humidity on top of the heat, you know, and when you get hot, you perspire to cool your body down. But if it's a really humid climate, then you literally can't cool down and people are stroking out. Um, there were uh, really dozens of people going to the hospital from football games. I, I sort of noted that in some of the articles. So people are outside and they just don't know. And if you're young or you're elderly, um, so there's things like malaria, again, warmer, wetter weather makes mosquito-borne diseases, you know, are going to happen more often, right? So we've seen cases recently in Florida of malaria, and we hadn't had that in, in, you know, very, very, very long time. So it affects our health. It's affecting, as you said, weather patterns, whether it be the Gulf Stream, you know, or the wildfires. I myself went to uh, Pennsylvania for a, a memorial for my uncle, and uh, we were flying into this wildfire smoke. So it's all around us. My own sister and her husband lost their home on Pine Island in St. James City for Hurricane Ian. So it starts to get really personal. We had a recent rain bomb in Fort Lauderdale. And, you know, I know people who actually work in the arena of climate and energy and resilience who were caught in that storm and their car was totaled as a result of, you know, being flooded. So it's starting to just really be there in our everyday lives. And, you know, it's interesting because the alternative which is to transition to a clean energy economy is actually a good thing. It's going to make our air cleaner, our water cleaner, you know, and, and, and it's less expensive, but again, you know, we're, we're, we're in this transition. It's happening already. Uh, for instance, Florida is the second largest market in the U S for electric vehicles uh, as an example. Um, but, you know, uh, people who are selling these products, you know, it's their sort of last um, attempt to sort of drag this transition out. And we don't have a moment to waste. So we, again, we've already, you know, are kind of locked in for two feet. We've seen a foot. We're going to see another foot. And we need to keep Florida above water uh, by reducing the rate, you know, of sea rise. And the only way to do that is to stop using fossil fuels. So as you point out, some of this, all this information that we have about the impacts of climate change on Florida and on the rest of the world suggests that the state should be doing everything it can to alleviate the causes of climate change, which you're pointing out is emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and also to prepare for the impacts of climate disruption. But as we're going to hear the rest of this hour, the our governor is kind of doing almost the exact opposite on a lot of those things. Uh, in Texas last week, the Governor Ron DeSantis put forward his energy policy platform, and it, I, I want to be fair, but I, I think the, the, the best way to summarize it is drill, baby, drill. DeSantis criticized efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by moving toward renewable energy and electric vehicles. So let's talk now about electric vehicles. Uh, one of the things that Governor DeSantis has done recently is end subsidies for uh, some for some um, renewable energy ideas like subsidies for electric vehicles. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, there was a moment in around 2017 when the transportation sector kind of overcame the electric generation, you know, sector uh, as far as emissions. So it's really important uh, to electrify transportation. So something the governor did recently, which shocked a lot of people, actually, which was there was a bill that passed the legislature in a completely bipartisan way that was going to allow uh, state agencies, um, local governments to consider the total cost of ownership when purchasing fleets, right? So, you know, we, you know, there are individuals buying electric vehicles, but there's a lot of power in electric fleets and, and bus fleets and so forth. So the average, on average, a transit bus that's electric over the life time of, of that vehicle will save about $300,000. So it is cheaper. Consumer Reports has done a number of analysis of electric vehicles. And on average, for around the same size vehicle, you're going to save, you know, eight to $10,000 over the life cycle. So it is cheaper to use electric. So it may cost a little more up front, but over the life cycle, um, you know, that that's just a fact. So the governor wants to ignore that. This is pure 
politics. So he's out in Iowa campaigning for president and Donald Trump, you know, is, uh, you know, giving him a hard time over electric vehicles. Right. So he shifts gears and uh, previous Governor DeSantis had been supportive of, of EV roadmaps and making sure that we have EV charging infrastructure. In fact, I can recall him being at a press conference on the turnpike announcing, um, you know, charging uh, stations on, along the turnpike. So, you know, this is happening. It's sort of whether we like it or not. But here's where Florida is very important. If Florida was a country, we'd have, I don't know, the 15th or 16th largest economy. So what we do matters because this is about creating markets. Because up to this point, and, and, and globally, there's been just enormous trillions of dollars going to subsidize the oil industry, the fossil fuel industry. And we certainly do that in this country. So what we need to do is create a more level playing field. So these clean energy, you know, options, you know, just have their, have an opportunity to thrive, to create a market uh, for clean energy. It is cheaper. Florida sends about $65 billion a year out of state every year, each and every year, to bring in fossil fuels from somewhere else. So if we're more efficient in our homes or how we build buildings, in our transportation, in our power generation, we will keep those energy dollars here at home, working in our community, putting people to work, not sending it out of state, which also has the byproduct of warming the planet. And you know, I having been worked in this arena of climate and energy issues for about 23 years now, I've had many, many people, you know, use this phrase to say to me, I don't believe in climate change. And I say, you believe in the virgin birth or not, that is a tenant of faith. Climate change is a measurement. They measure ice core samples and they know the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. It is parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. We are well past, you know, 420 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. The safer place would be to be at about 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. It is a measurement and like your weight and your height, you might not like it but it just is. And so that's where we're at. So for people to, especially in positions of leadership and power, you know, to put out misinformation that this is some kind of, you know, I hate to even use the phrase hoax because it's just, it's just absurd. And they're ignoring basic science and facts for their own either political purposes or for the fossil fuel industry so they can make money selling products. And I'll just mention in Florida, anybody notice their electric bill going up? Well, that is the purview of the state of Florida. That is Governor Ron DeSantis, who appoints the regulators to the Florida Public Service Commission. And Florida is over-reliant on fossil methane gas. We are 75% reliant on gas. The two biggest utilities in the state, Duke and Florida Power and Light's parent company, Next Era own a pipeline. They own the Sable Trail pipeline. So they make money sort of coming and going because they're selling you electricity and then the fuel cost and your bills have been going through the roof in part because Russia invaded Ukraine and gas prices are through the roof. But we're 75% reliant on gas and we don't do energy efficiency programs in a meaningful way in the state of Florida. So out of 53 utilities around the country, and this comes from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, they just came out with their most recent rankings. Uh, Tampa Electric is 40, uh, Duke is 46, and Florida Power and Light is 52 out of 53 in offering energy efficiency programs. But your bill keeps going up, 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 and no one seems very concerned about that in the governor's office or in the legislature. Our guest is Susan Glickman, Programs and Policy Consultant to both Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Rethink Energy Florida. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And Susan, you were just talking about methane and uh, the governor, when he was in Texas, make, mentioning his energy policy, he talked a lot about methane. So let me go through some of the things he said, and you can tell us uh, 
uh, how accurate or, or what what this all means. So uh, DeSantis is agreeing with you. He said that Florida is very heavily reliant on methane gas. It's called natural gas or liquefied natural gas or methane gas. And uh, he said that methane has lower emissions than coal. What's the story there? Um, in, in kind of a perfect world, a natural gas fuel power plant would be about half the emissions of a traditional coal fire power plant. However, when you frack the gas and frack fracking is short for hydraulic fracturing, and that's when they put chemicals in and it's almost creates like a little earthquake to bring up more of this gas. And when you frack the gas, it releases methane. And on the life cycle of that whole operation, of a methane gas power plant in the whole life cycle and bringing up the gas can be as bad of a emitter as a coal plant. And I can tell you, I, I recall the moment I was at a conference and listening to, you know, to Princeton scientists talk about this. And I about fell out my chair because, you know, the whole idea was that gas was better than coal. And so, you know, it might be, it could be, but when you frack the gas, by and large, your overall life cycle emissions are as bad as a coal plant. So, um, and the other thing that's somewhat interesting about that is this all takes an enormous amount of water. So, you know, we talk about climate change, but water is one of the biggest environmental crises that we have, or the biggest, and it is is made worse by warming climate and drought. So it's interesting because Governor DeSantis, the way he uh, sort of separated himself in the primary in his very first election uh, against Adam Putnam was to go after the water issue. And at that time, right, we had blue green algae, which we still do, but it was very, um, you know, very present in that moment. And he was criticizing the sugar industry and talking about water. And he created a blue green algae task force and their recommendations. My, I'm told by my friends who work on springs issues full time said, you know, um, on a scale of one to 10, the recommendations were a three. And then we didn't pass those either. So very little has been done about that issue, but that is the issue. Water quality is really the issue that brought him into office. And as people often write about, uh, environmental advocates were somewhat optimistic initially when Ron DeSantis got into office. So what you're seeing now is really pure politics. When you're out in Iowa campaigning and people want to talk about ethanol, you know, that comes from corn products that, you know, has been a historic, um, you know, the economic boost for that part of the country. And so all of a sudden we're against electric vehicles and now we're all for, you know, gas driven engines. But it's it's really distressing to see someone in a position of power just so ignore basic scientific facts, you know, for his own perceived political gain. Um, but, you know, that's where we are. And um, everyone needs to, you know, pay attention to this. And I, you know, recognize the many, many challenges because the perception was that climate change and this warming was something that was way far down the road, right? And, you know, we're, it's easy to just kind of put it off or just think someone else is taking care of it. But but here we are. And Florida needs to be a national leader. I mentioned earlier what a big state we are. So we help to create markets and we need to be a national and a global leader on this so that because um, it is a global problem. You know, it's it's an individual problem where we all make decisions in our lives. But really, it's we need policies to move us. We need a level playing field. We need to stop subsidizing polluters to pollute for free because that's exactly where we are people who who you know the the fossil fuel industry gas companies utilities those folks who are selling these products are polluting for free and we are all paying for it we pay for it in our taxes we pay for it with these disasters you ticked off some of these disasters they are incredibly costly and once again we have to adapt to the climate impacts already in the pipeline. And on a sea rise uh, you know, notion, that's about two feet. 
that's already expensive. Beyond two feet is too much and it's too expensive. And people don't realize that it's six inches of sea rise. You start to get saltwater intrusion into freshwater supply. Now, if people understand that, that's why, you know, I'm on the bandwagon with Rethink Energy Florida to keep Florida above water because I really don't think people understand what a degree and a half means. Like, that's not a practical notion. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'll turn the air down a little bit, but we're talking uh, sewage backing up in the streets, right? And in Southeast Florida, they're having more inland flooding, you know, but we're starting to see that in Tampa Bay as well. This is going to cost us big time. So the sooner we get started to transitioning, the, the cheaper it will be for us to do so. So that is inevitable. So when people put out misinformation to slow down this process, you know, it's 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 just really troubling. So we were talking about the governor's policy and his speech in Texas recently. During that speech on the subject of methane and natural gas, Governor DeSantis said that he recommended that the U.S. withdraw from its global methane pledge. What impact would that have if the, if the U.S. did that? Well, I mean, we're a big leader and we emit sort of, you know, more than our fair share, uh, to say the least. So methane is more potent than a, than carbon. It's 84 times more potent because it has a shorter lifespan. So um, it's, uh, would you know, it would set us back further. So you've got methane from oil and gas operations. And that's what I was referring to earlier when they do hydraulic fracturing to bring up more gas that emits methane in the process. And then all along the way from, you know, from the pipeline, right to the power plant, um, even, and, and of course the governor has made a big fuss over gas stoves. So even those gas stoves in people's homes, we don't have a lot of gas stoves in Florida uh, as much as they do up in more usually Northern climates. But gas is is leaked throughout the process. It leaks all day in your kitchen. It leaks coming in to the home. Same thing with gas pipelines. So, so there's methane from oil and gas sort of operations, if you will. Then there's methane that we get in landfills. So this is a huge problem and we haven't paid that much attention to. I recognize that's not what Governor Santos was referring to, but I want people, you know, just full, full information. So we, about 16% of the organics that go into landfills is really usable produce and we can work and help farmers. We can help the agriculture community. And then we can actually take, you know, that usable produce and get it to people or, you know, put it in the beef stew at, you know, at, at schools or, or whatever. But um, that's really a potent form of, you know, of, of a greenhouse gas emitter. So we need to, to get on that. And the U.S. has to show leadership. I mean, that's just, that has been who we have been in the world and we emit more than our fair share and we need to work globally and we need to move these new technologies. And, you know, it's funny when I was just a kid, I remember my parents were like bought one of those early Amana radar ranges. They cost a thousand dollars. They were the size of a small condo and the quality was awful, right? You know, the only thing you ever wanted to do was boil water in it. So now you can, you know, go into a Target or whatever, a Walmart and buy a, a quality microwave for, you know, under a hundred bucks. And that's where we're at. The price of solar has dropped 90%. In the last decade, energy efficiency was always the cheap, you know, option. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, we do not offer our utilities in Florida do not offer meaningful energy efficiency programs and people are really suffering so we can save money. We can clean our air. We can clean our water, you know, and and use less water. You know, we are in a water crisis and power plants and, you know, just use a lot of water and it takes a lot of water to frack. And, you know, people are seeing that uh, around the country. So um, we we can do better. We have the technologies and it's just a matter of, of will. My guest is Susan Glickman, who is programs and policy consultant to both Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Rethink Energy Florida. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting live from the studios of WMNF in Tampa on September 26th. And I'd like to hear what you think about this. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org. 
You can text 813-433-0885. Please sign your name and you can call us at 813-239-9663. Let me read a couple of the emails that have come in. Uh, Bob in Sarasota writes, the governor vetoed $350 million from the federal government for energy savings. So thanks for that email, Bob. And uh, Karen in, in Dunedin says, unfortunately, I don't believe we will ever get on the same page. I think that's opioid. I think she meant, you know, I think that she's trying to combine hope and opioid, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I'm fearful for my children and grandchildren's future. So thank you for that email, Karen. And then Pete in Indian Shores has a question for you, Susan. She, he says, I'm curious, if we're all going underwater here on the peninsula, why are banks still dishing out major loans to folks that want to live on the beach? Are they not aware of the rising tide or maybe they know something that we don't? So how would you respond to Pete in Indian Shores? You know, actually, uh, Pete, um, I do know that banks are are reconsidering uh, loans in areas that are, you know, flood over and over. I'm shocked myself to see the uh, building. I live on the barrier island. I'm a native of Tampa. Um, and, you know, I, I'm concerned every day at the notion that I, I can't even allow myself to think about, you know, giving our home to the next generation. And, you know, and it maybe it's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, when you're looking at 30 year mortgages, uh, you know, banks are taking a look at that. And I've been told that by big banks like JP Morgan Chase and others. And a lot of them have been um, investing. I, I did want to mention the first comment about the 347 million. What uh, Governor Ron DeSantis did was he vetoed a budget item that was for $5 million to set up a program to facilitate a $347 million uh, you know, source of federal funding to come down for energy efficiency rebates. And half of that is really aimed at low income. So when it comes to energy efficiency, I know sometimes it can seem, you know, counterintuitive, but you can reduce, you know, as much as a third of your energy bill with a high efficiency air conditioner, you know, for instance, but all of it, the insulation and windows and appliances. So um, that's really sad. So here we are in the state of Florida, we had an opportunity for the most vulnerable people to become more efficient, reduce their energy bill and, and this pollution. And, and the governor said, no, thank you. So I know that several members of Congress, including Congresswoman Kathy Castor and others, um, are asking the Department of Energy if they could more directly facilitate, you know, those those rebates. But, you know, why would a governor want to make you pay more in your taxes for fleets, right? So all those cost savings for vehicles and, and buses, you know, he said, no, thank you to that. And then same thing with this energy efficiency. And that's an equity issue because affluent people are getting more efficient all the time. So, um, so anyway, this is a, you know, it's been a real slow moving train, especially for, again, someone who's been working in this arena for two decades. Um, but I think the chickens are starting to come home to roost a bit here. Um, and we're, we're seeing a lot of, of issues, but, and I know, you know, back, back to Pete in Indian shores, you know, I go down, I travel around the state, you know, and I see cranes and building going on like crazy, even in some of our most vulnerable communities like you know Miami-Dade County um and uh, it's I I I don't know if that's just a kind of a cognitive cognitive dissonance uh you know from from the reality uh but you know again if we're talking about 10 years from now 20 years from now you know uh, we're starting to see it already and and the seas are rising that's just a fact that's Susan Glickman, program and policy consultant to both Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Rethink Energy Florida. We've been talking about the governor's policies on climate and on energy, and he gave a major speech in Texas last week about this subject. Let's just hear about a minute of the, the governor speaking, and then we'll listen to what he said and then come back and kind of break it down and, and see what's going on with that. This is Tuesday Cafe brought to you by WMNF in Tampa. Make no mistake about it. We've seen a concerted effort to ramp up the fear when it comes to things like global warming and climate change. For example, the Oxford English Dictionary noted that between 2018 and 2020, the use of the word cli the phrase climate crisis increased 20-fold and the phrase climate emergency 76-fold. 
making it their chosen word of the year in 2019. Now, this is driven by ideology. It's not driven by reality. In reality, human beings are safer than ever from climate disasters as the death rate from climate disasters has declined by 98% over the last 100 years. And the number one reason for that is people that have had access to reliable electricity and power. Well, that is Governor DeSantis speaking last week in front of an oil rig in Texas. And he's putting forward a conspiracy theory there about why the terms climate crisis and climate emergency are being used more and more. But let me ask my guest, Susan, if there's maybe a simpler reality-based explanation for why we are hearing more about climate crisis and climate emergency. Well, the fact is we're seeing more of the impacts of a warming, you know, climate. So, you know, it's interesting because part of what the governor said when he was in front of an oil rig in Midland, Texas, was that somehow he was going to bring gas prices down to $2 a gallon. The fact is, is, you know, petroleum is really based, prices are in a global market, right? It's for crude oil and the operations of it and the transportation of it and so on. And you don't really pay the true cost of gas at the pump because you're paying it in your taxes as well. So it costs, it's, it's you know, I think it gives people a bit of a false illusion over that. So what's really interesting about sort of the word salad uh, thing that Governor DeSantis went into was that it was a Republican pollster named Frank Luntz who changed the, the narrative about that because it was called global warming, right? That was the re reference in terms of the language. And the governor actually used that phrase surprisingly. Uh, and then and he was advising Frank Luntz, members of Congress, to say, call it climate change because the climate is always changing. And he quite recently sort of apologized for that. He appeared before a Senate committee and said, I made a mistake. I was wrong, you know, and and so on. There has been a concerted effort by the fossil fuel industry and the people who do their bidding, which in some cases are elected officials, members of Congress, state legislatures, governors, um, and they do that with all kinds of things, campaign contributions and, and so forth. So they have sought to confuse people, and that's why they switch from global warming to climate change. So, you know, we, we are in an emergency because we have a short window. We have a short window to transition because the decisions you make around energy stick with you for a very long time. If you build a power plant, you know, it's going to be around for 60 years or more. So these are the decisions. If you put up electric vehicle charging infrastructure, then people are more likely to buy electric vehicles. You know, I mean, it's it's sort of obvious if the only thing you see, you know, is is just gas stations, then, you know, that's going to affect your your choices. Um, I always say, you know, if you're a hammer, everything you see is a nail. Um, and that's that's the truth. So we have an opportunity in this moment the big news in the climate change arena is the federal dollars coming down to really transition. And that is leveling a playing field because we've been subsidizing the polluters for so many years. They pollute for free and we pay for it and we're paying for it in our taxes. We're paying for it in our higher electric bills. And then we're paying for it with our health, you know, and then the, the warming climate. So, um, you know, we can turn in the opposite direction, but we need to do it as quickly as we possibly can to avoid the worst impacts, you know? I mean, eventually, you know, there, well, we, we're seeing crisis, you know, day after day. I mean, is the wildfires, you know, are these more intense storms, you know, not enough for people to, to kind of wake up uh, to what's going on? And the transition, you know, again, unless you're the one selling the fossil fuels, but what the uh, you know sort of public relations campaigns have done is they've created a sort of divisive tribalism around this issue. And somehow, instead of just paying attention to the facts and the science, what President Lyndon Baines Johnson from Texas declared in 1965, I mean, it's very simple what we're doing. And they've known about it for a really long time. And, uh, and so it just seems incredibly irresponsible to continue to put out misinformation. And um, I've spent a lot of time looking at, you know, these sort of propaganda campaigns. And I have one sort of uh, report in, from 1988 that Shell Oil did. And they basically, in their 
sort of lovely British sort of way, say, look, by the time that people sort of figure this out, it will be too late to stabilize the climate of the planet because the decisions we make now, and when you put in this fossil fuel infrastructure like a pipeline, right? And and you build these power plants, you know, we could have been investing in energy efficiency and zero energy buildings and getting older housing stock under control. Um, but instead, you know, because in our state, and this is just one example, because the investor owned utilities that cover 75% of Florida, like Tampa Electric and Duke and Florida Power and Light, they get a guaranteed range of return when they make capital expenditures. So the incentive is on building power plants. That's how they make money. And our structure, our Florida Public Service Commission, you know, has allowed and rubber stamped them. That is something the governor makes the appointments. There's a, you know, a joint legislative committee and they come up with names, but the governor makes the appointments. And in, I think it was 2018, the governor appointed at the time, the 28 year old daughter of the president of the Senate, Kathleen Pasadoma is our current president of the Senate. And her, her daughter is a public service commissioner. So, you know, the, 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 for, for decades, the Florida public service commission has been considered captive to the utilities. So this is not something this current governor kind of invented, but um, you know the utilities are incredibly powerful, and they sort of have armies of lobbyists, and and we need policymakers that will stand up to big interests. We could say that about all kinds of the insurance industry. You know, we're in an insurance crisis, and it's it's interesting. I think that's one of the things that's really hitting home with people who weren't paying attention. And um, so that may be the insurance crisis is up with the climate crisis and climate emergency because people are seeing it, you know, and they're seeing it in their own lives. And, you know, we see growing seasons differently and people are just observing it. Um, you know, we're losing, uh, you know, glaciers and ice sheets and, you know, we don't know. And again, something that keeps someone like me up at night are these feedback loops because there are some unknowns. There's a lot we know, but as this permafrost is thawing and it's releasing methane, that's 86 times more potent than carbon in 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 a life cycle. It, it's we you know we just don't know what that's going to do. So we have um, you know projections about how quickly you know how fast this is happening, um, but they may be off base at some level. And I think the pressure on scientists has been you know, to kind of downplay it a little bit, right? And and to not seem too concerned. And I'm talking about over decades uh, because of some of these criticisms, but uh, but we're seeing it in, in, in real time. And uh, so we need to do everything we can on a personal level in our state. And then the state of Florida needs to be a national and an international leader. As I said, if we were a country, we'd have the 15th largest economy. So what we do matters and how we show up. And so to have sort of another drill baby drill moment in 2030, when it costs less to use electric vehicles, that's and, and it's a much more pleasant experience all the way around. But in transit, in school buses, you know, it protects the health to have an electric school bus protects the health of our kids and those people who drive those buses every day. So we need to protect our health. We can reduce our energy bills. We can, you know, save money while we protect our natural environment. And Florida's natural environment is our economy in so many respects. So I, you know, we've got to get moving and we need to get moving very quickly. Our guest is Susan Glickman, programs and policy consultant for Clim Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Rethink Energy Florida. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We're live on September 26th, and we're going to take some phone calls because a lot of people responded when they heard uh, what the governor was saying. Let's go first to Jack in Ellington. You're on the air. Jack, what would you like to say? Hey, good morning. Great, great program, by the way. I had a, I found DeSantis an enigma at first. He started off saying some good things about, you know, restoring, refunding uh, Florida forever and cleaning up water and that sort of stuff. But he hadn't delivered. I understand that. And if you, if you remember, in the toward the end of the pandemic, there was some federal money, no strings attached, that would extend the SNAP program. 
you know, feed hungry kids. And uh, he turned it down until he got pressure. I think eventually he had to accept it. And so I'm wondering, you know, what what would make a man do it? Just like he's turned down the 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 other proposal more recently, free free federal money. Uh, and then I realized he's not a Republican at all. He's a rhino. What he is is an Ayn Rand libertarian, <laughs> an extreme libertarian. He came out of the uh, he came out of the uh, Federalist Society when he was in college, which is of course funded by the Coke consortium of cajillionaires, and the Cokes got their money initially refining oil for Russia. So um, it, it simply boils down to this. From their view, if you look at the extreme libertarian view, they simply don't think those are proper functions of government. They don't think there should be any taxes. They want to do away with the IRS. They want to do away with public schools, Social Security. Uh, Medicare, anything that's not in the Constitution, they want to get rid of it. That's my comment. All right. Thank you so much, Jack. Thanks for calling in. And uh, if you'd like to email us, dj at wmnf.org. We'll try to get to Brent and Leela very shortly. Uh, but let me go back to my guest, Susan Glickman, who is with Rethink Energy Florida, a consultant and Florida Clinicians for Climate Action. And I want to ask about more things that Governor DeSantis was saying in uh, in Texas one of the things that he said is that uh, one of the reasons that DeSantis said that he didn't like renewable energy, that he preferred oil and gas, he wanted to he wanted to have speedy permitting of new oil and gas permits because he called renewables unproven technologies that lead to blackouts. So Texas had a blackout, a really major blackout recently. Is that because of their over-reliance on unproven technologies, in quotes, like uh, renewable energy? No, uh, the problem in Texas, Texas is um, is an island in the electric. They have their own, you know, uh, you know, transmission systems. And so now there that was a cold weather gas problem. So it was fossil gas. That was that was the problem there. You know, distributed. We've had a, a system with centralized power. Right. And that's what the utilities, you know, have grown up around and they've got uh, franchise agreements because the idea is that you don't charge people to deliver the power. And then the Florida Public Service Commission is supposedly the hall monitor. Right. They're the regulators to make sure that they're giving you the lowest cost power. I mean, we know right off the bat that they're not because they don't do energy efficiency in a really significant, meaningful way. And that's always the, the cheapest. So having a distributed system is actually going to strengthen that because it's not just one power plant and a set of transmission lines. You have transmission line loss. If you can generate the power closer to, um, you know, to where it's used, it's just a more efficient system. So we're going to, in new construction, you know, one of the difficulties with the uh, sort of solutions for climate change um, is there's not one, there's like 250. And, you know, we are kind of instant gratification people and it sounds easier to just to throw up a big old power plant and be done with it. So you're going to have to do different things on older homes, right? And we have a lot of older housing stock. That's why it's such a shame uh, that we are ignoring, you know, this energy efficiency uh, investments that we could be bringing to Florida. There was another, a smaller pot of money, but the Environmental Protection Agency is giving out a million dollar planning grants in the top around 80 um, metropolitan statistical areas. And Florida is getting five. Originally, the governor could have raised his hands for three million. And then four regions in Florida were each getting a million. And he did not. So that goes back to the federal government, goes into a pot, and then uh, three more areas got it. And now Sarasota and Northport is also getting a planning grant. And those planning grants are going to position these regions, the Jacksonville region, Southeast Florida, Tampa Bay, Sarasota, and East Central Florida, the Orlando region, for a pot of $4.7 billion uh, for bigger projects. So, you know, there's some funding there. We're, in a sense, kind of restructuring the incentives because we have not had a level playing field. We have been subsidizing fossil fuels forever. 
And now we're going to do this transition. We're creating markets. The costs are coming down. And, um, you know, there's there's great opportunities. There's also another pot of money called Solar for All. It's a $7 billion pot of money. And the state of Florida could have applied for that, but they're not. And that is because the governor is playing politics because he's running for president and he's running in a Republican primary. So he's going sort of as far to the right, if you will. It was interesting, the caller talking about being a libertarian. I mean, my own experience is that libertarians, um, like true conservatives, value free market and competition. So when you support, you know, monopolies like we have covering 75 percent of Florida. Um, we don't have, we're one of only four states where the law expressly prohibits anyone other than your government assigned monopoly utility to deliver power to you. So, um, you know, that doesn't sound very libertarian, right? So I think people, I, you know, just always struggled with all these labels because, you know, they're, they're kind of used and abused and, and don't necessarily mean what people think they mean. So, um, you know, this is just about playing politics. It's appealing to kind of the tribalism of, of this around this issue. This cannot be a political issue. You cannot adapt your way out of climate change. And again, it is one thing to adapt to two feet, you know, in a low lying state like Florida. But, you know, we're also seeing crises all over the country and all over the world. So it's not just limited to Florida, but we have a special, you know, sort of set of challenges being so low lying. And we have got to reduce the rate of sea rise. And the only way to do that is to reduce the driver, the climate pollution that's causing the planet to warm. The planet will be fine. It's the people on the planet, right? I mean, we had dinosaurs for whatever, 200 million years, and they're not here. So, you know, things, you know, this is not a, a guarantee, you know, that we're not going to make this planet quite inhospitable. Um, and speaking of these electric vehicles, I met, remember during the Trump administration, the National Highway and Transportation uh, Agency, you know, put out a, a report because he was uh, requiring or changing the fuel efficiency, right? So cars and manufacturing, that doesn't happen overnight. You you set up and you you see what's going on now with the shift to electric vehicles because you've set up manufacturing facilities for particular kinds of cars. And you know that's just the way it works. Um, the Trump administration's own agency said that if they rolled back these fuel efficiency standards, which again, were already well on their way. So as a practical matter, it didn't happen and it wasn't going to happen. But that was going to bring us parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere in the upper 600s. Like I said earlier, we're past 420. We should be at 350. Um, and I mean, it was hard for me to even contemplate what would life on earth be like if we were at 600 or 700 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere? It'd be a very inhospitable place. And that just not, you know, I mean, that's not going to work well. So uh, we've got to get control of this climate pollution and it's causing a pollution blanket that is warming the planet. And I think, you know, as people are seeing these impacts and paying attention, you know, maybe more people are starting to understand that. But I do think that if we talked about this in terms of feet, it would be something people could conceive more rather than just a degree and a half, uh, which is something that I would suggest doesn't mean much to, to most people. But but we can do better. We have the technology. And now it's just a matter of the will. Well, let's see if we can squeeze Leela from Brandon in, uh, This who's calling on the telephone in the last few seconds that we have here. Leela, do you have a quick, a quick comment or question? Yeah, I just am appreciative that we've had a couple of uh, news headlines on the tree canopies and that we're getting the million dollars to plant re replant the deficit negative 30% of the trees that they've um, expired in Tampa. And just to everybody, if we could all just plant more trees and um, recognize that um, there are good people trying to help. Uh, we need to get our county commission on board that, you know, we have green spaces all over that are just being cut back and we need those trees. So if I'll just leave it at that, I know you're limited on time. Yeah, thanks for the comments. And we are out of time, but I do want to thank our guests for coming on Tuesday Cafe. Thanks so much, Susan. Thanks for having me, Sean. I really appreciate you coming on. Susan Glickman is programs and policy consultant to both Florida Clinicians for Climate Action and Rethink Energy Florida. 
And I want to thank our phone screener, Greg Bowers. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF in Tampa. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. And their guest is Pinellas County Commissioner Charlie Justice. He'll continue to talk about climate issues with beach erosion and also about the proposed new stadium for the Tampa Bay Rays. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on September 26th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We are also broadcasting to St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. You can support the programming like this by donating at WMNF.org. Thanks so much for joining us today on Tuesday Cafe.